What are some of the things you think you fear most in this world? I think probably the number one on top of the list is probably death, right? Many of us fear death. We don't know what it'll be like. We've seen it from a distance. We've all lost loved ones, moms, dads, grandpas, grandmothers. But we haven't been through it by virtue of the fact that we're still sitting here. But we know in the back of our thinking, we don't like to think about it, but we know someday we'll be breathing our last and closing our eyes for a final time. So I think death pretty much tops the list. I think next to death would be being alone in death. Dying alone by yourself. That would be, I think, frightening for some people. There's many things that scare us. How we're going to feed our families, how we're going to... Our health scares. You know, none of us want to hear that word when the doctor says, I'm afraid we, you have inoperable cancer. There's nothing we can do. And fear grips us. I mean, just shoves its deadly talons into our very being and everything goes out the window and it paralyzes us. And that happens to Christians too. Unless we build strong our faith and we read and we study and we read and we study and we pray and we study and we pray all of our lives, you know, we're all grown adults now and how many meals have we eaten over our lives? Millions? Which one do you remember the most? <laughs> Probably the last one. <laughs> but which one did the most good for your body? All of them. Well, maybe not the checkers burgers or the crystal burgers, but... Well, faith is kind of that way. You don't just pray once. You just don't accept Jesus once. You don't just study the Bible once and everything's full. It's just like eating strengthens your body and keeps it strong all these years. Pray, study, worship, sing. All of these are little courses that add to your physical, faithful strength over the years. So that when that day comes and you are afraid, and it will come, Jesus said, oh, it's on its way. The storms are coming. You will be ready. And yeah, you can be affected by the storms. Who isn't? But you can overcome the storm and say, you know, even though I'm in the valley of death, this may be my last time. I will not fear. For God is with me. His rod and his staff are on my side. That's the point to which the Christian must mature. That's the point that every man and woman should strive for in their Christian walk, if you want to call it that. When Jesus, his final promises, this world will bring you trouble, only trouble and trials. But don't fear this world. I have overcome it. And in me, you can overcome it. You know, in 1615, there was a single mom who had a little boy named John. She loved her little boy named John and took every manner and care to see that he was healthy and clean and fed and all of that stuff until one day he wasn't feeling well and he was having trouble and his head hurt real bad. And so mom took him to the doctors, what would be a doctor in those days. And they said that unfortunately the little boy was losing his eyesight because of macular degeneration. They didn't call it that, but that's what it was. He was losing his eyesight and it wouldn't be very long before he would be in total darkness. Mom was just dumbstruck. She didn't know what to do. But she was not going to let it win. So she sold about everything she had and she decided to take that little boy as best she could to see some of the wonders of the world. 
She was going to take them to Rome to see the Colosseum. She was going to take them to Egypt to see the pyramids. She was going to take them, you know, to all these different events and places before he lost his eyesight because they had read about him in books so many times at night before bed. And she did. And it was quick. And it was just a few months before he was blind. It would only be two years after that that she would die of a fever. And little John would be left alone in the darkness forever. But he knew the love of his mom and he knew the strength of his mom and she, he knew the Lord God that his mother knew. So he dwelt in darkness for many years and prayed every day for God, for protection, for life, for blessing. And in 1664, little John got a visit from God. And it was in that visit that he saw a vision of paradise. And little John Milton wrote Paradise Lost which became one of the greatest Christian anthems of the world for eons, for centuries. Paradise lost. A walk through heaven. Funny that God should choose a little boy named John, just like he chose an apostle John, to see the same thing in the Revelation. In 1860, or 1669, that book was published. His mother took him to see some of the wonders of the world. He took all of us to see the wonders of eternity. You know, I don't know anything scarier than being plunged into darkness, losing your eyesight for your whole life. That would be more than just an inconvenience to me. It would make me a better driver, I'm sure. <laughs> Stop it, Thomas. But that's a scary thing, isn't it? Losing your eyesight. And yet a boy saw heaven and wrote about it. And we've been blessed for centuries because of it. How do we overcome fear? Well, I think Jesus tells us that this morning. He says that, first of all, all of us are going to face certain losses. We're all going to face certain losses. It may be a parent. It may be a, terribly, a beloved child. It may be a job. It may be a spouse. I mean, the trials come in many fashion and form. The storms are always about us raging. Sometimes it comes by way of riots and mobs burning down your, build, your, your business that you've worked for your whole life. Nothing you've done, but nevertheless, here comes the storms. How do we respond? Because we're all going to suffer losses. Jesus tells us that. He doesn't say if you're going to suffer. It's when you're going to suffer. Everybody's going to get hit by the storms of this earth. The question is, how will you respond to it? Will you be paralyzed in fear? Will you collapse and give up the ship, throw up your arms and say, forget about it? 90% of us will. But then there's the blessed 10% that say, you know, this is not going to change my life. This is not going to make me believe in something other than my God. And with my God and His help and His mercy and His compassion, we can overcome this. We can rebuild this. We can remake this. And it'll be better than it ever was. I've lost a spouse, but I'm not alone. I've lost my child, but I'm not alone. You will all scatter and abandon me. Most friends do when you fall upon hard times. Jesus tells us that. Not only do you got to suffer the tribulation, but then all your friends run off. And they did. And Jesus says, and even when that happens, you're still not alone. God is still right here. He's still God. Nothing's changed. You know... Years ago, uh, Carol and I were back in Paris. We've been there a couple few times. 
And we went to the Louvre and we went to see the Mona Lisa. Y'all know the Mona Lisa. And uh, you know, I was surprised the first time I saw it because it's little. It's a little painting about that big. You know, you see it in these books and you see it and it looks huge, right? And you just think, wow, this is a giant big old painting of, you know, old Mona being Lisa. <laughs> and, uh, but it's not, it's a little small, 16 by 20 maybe, maybe, inches. And they got it mounted and it bulletproof, bomb proof glass and all this stuff and it's up on a giant board and you know they got things marking it all off and you can come up to the, to the things there, the barrier. And there's lots of people, you know, start fighting to get a look at it. I was, when we were there, we, we were part of the crowd and we were, you know, doing what we do. Uh, but there was a curator over there and a security guy as well, you know, keeping an eye on it. Do you realize that for about five, four years, or three years, I can't remember. But anyway, for a couple of years, uh, the Mona Lisa was stolen. Somebody took it. Snuck in, breached security, breached everything, got it off the wall, put it in the old handbag, and out the door they went. And for three years, the curator said, the greatest attendance they ever had was when that picture was missing. They came and looked at the blank wall, where it was. And the background thing, you know, they got it hanging on a real nice background. And they just stood there in awe. And I said, there's nothing there. And they just stood there and they couldn't believe that some, someone would take and steal such a treasure and deny everybody that blessing. That's what fear does when trials come to your life and we throw up our hands and we abandon everything and we say, I am beat, forget it. I'm never going back there again. You're like the Mona Lisa that's now stolen. People still desire it. People still need it. People still want it. But it's missing because you've thrown up your arms. You've given up. Instead of being and remaining strong and being a blessing to everyone, having peace when there is no peace, having calm when there's no calm, as Christians are called to do, we instead give in and surrender to the world, the trials of the world, and we deny everyone else the blessing that we could be to them. Jesus makes it quite plain. There, that beautiful setting, the Last Supper, everybody's just, wow, boy, right there in the spirit and presence of God himself. And he says, boys, I'm going to tell you one final thing before we leave tonight, and that is, do you now believe? Really believe? Oh, I know what you've been saying to me. But has it a change occurred in your life? How strong are you really in your faith? Because I'm going to tell you something. The hour is at hand right now. And they're going to unleash a fury as such you have never known. How are you going to be affected by that? I'll tell you. You're all going to run away and blow me off, first of all. And they did. Only one went to Calvary to watch his Savior die. Only John. There's that name again, John. Only John was at Calvary to watch Jesus die. So much so that he entrusted his own mother to John's hand. The others were overwhelmed by the storm and swept away. Only John stood tall and fast and strong and became the blessing. First to Mary and then to everybody. Only John used and made God his hiding place. I don't care what happens to me. And there at the very end of his life, abandoned on an island to die, alone. There's that fear, death alone thing again. He falls to his knees in the sand on the beach. 
And he prays and he asks God, is it true? Was it all true or not? But now he's an old broken man, beat up by life, persecuted by the Romans, and left to die on a lonely island. And he goes and makes God his hiding place one more time. God, is it true? Amazing thing, God shows up, doesn't he? Amen. He says, John, come here. Take my hands, stand up. And he took him to see the splendor of paradise. And it's in that time that God says again to him, write these words because they are faithful and they are true. Most beautiful promise of the revelation. Write these words. They are faithful and they are true and take them to my children in the churches. And that very night, Jesus said, I got news for you, boys. The world's coming. It's here now. And it brings only tribulations and trials and sufferings and hurt. But fear not. I am your hiding place. I've overcome this world. You know those little guidepost magazines? Y'all have any of those? They're good. They're, they got little devotionals you have. You, you read them with your coffee. There's a woman that writes in there, Jill Myers. And she's a good writer. So, you know, kind of a cutesy tootsie sort of storyteller. But she writes of a very black time in her life, a very dark time, and that's when, you know, she was a young woman and she fell in love, and they got all, you know, all squishy like they do, and then eventually they got married. Oh, they were so much in love. I mean, they're, you, they're no wrong anywhere. They were all, you know, roses and angels and unicorns and all that stuff were flying over them all the time. Everywhere they went, I mean, choirs were singing, roses would bloom, and just, they were that happy. And for about five or six years, it was just total wedded bliss until one day she came home and her husband said, I don't feel so good. So she said, well, let's go to the doctor. And they went to the doctor and he died in the doctor's office. Wow. Massive coronary, whatever. She went into a dark place for a long time. A very long time. Wouldn't eat, wouldn't talk to anybody, locked herself away. Wanted nothing to do with the world. One day, a mailman came to her house and pushed a little card through her mail slot. And she opened it. It had no return address on it. The card was not signed by anybody. And she opened it. And it was just a plain white card. And she opened it. And it had four words. And the four words was, It does get better. And it had a little cross drawn on it. She pondered that card. She must have read it 300 million times, according to her, and she sat in her dark room in her darkness and began to question anew how strong her faith was. She began to question anew how strong her God was. She realized she had succumbed to this fear of loss, this fear of being alone, this darkness that had overcome her. And that she had relinquished the strength of her faith. She had relinquished the presence of her Holy Spirit, of the God. And she began to turn on some lights. She began to come out of that room she began to open some of her windows and she decided that she's no longer going to live like this. 
that whoever sent that card was right. It can get better, but only when I acknowledge the Lord and walk in faith with Him. And step by step, it took a while. About seven months later, after that first card, here came a second one through the door. Again, no return address. And to this day, she has no idea who, what, when, where, why that happened. Card came through the door, the slot in the door. She picked it up, opened it up again, same white card. No signature, no nothing. And at the top, it said, rewrite a new story. Rewrite your life, basically. Write a new story. That's when she got involved with guideposts and began to use her newfound faith. It was a faith that she claimed she always had. But when it came right down to it, she failed to use. Corey Ten Boom was beaten and raped, abused in every possible way, tortured, painful, thrown down on a cold hard slab of concrete in a German prison camp. And she saw a little ant, so fragile in life, you know, you could just step on it and not even know it. And it ran into a hiding place and she couldn't even spend time with the ant. And she prayed the most significant prayer in her life, God, let me make you my hiding place. At least until the storms blow over. And the war ended and she became one of the greatest Christian blessings to all of Europe, as well as America. And the Lord asked his boys one final question. Do you believe, really? Because the hour is at hand and the storm is already here. And every one of you will be affected by it in one way or another. Will you run away and hide to save yourself? Or will you hide in me and overcome the storm? Because I tell you, the world will bring you only tribulation. But for those who believe, I have already overcome this world. Do you believe, really? Really? last promise God gave us. I am your hiding place. Hide in me. Let us pray. Father, life can be very difficult. That is, a, that is guaranteed and most everyone here already knows that. So let us begin to rebuild our faith to strengthen it in ways we've never been strengthened before, to study, to pray, to sing, to worship, to be glad in Jesus our Christ, not to just for our eternal consequence, but that we can overcome even the hardest times of this world. Let us hide in your Son, Jesus, every day, strengthening, living, and emulating his strength. That even though we're found, we find ourselves alone, we are not alone, for God is still with us. Bless us, Father, to this end we pray. Amen and amen.